Welcome to Reach Out for Life. It is our goal to present a thoughtful and practical Christianity for today, which you can discover with your mind and live to the full with your life. And now the host of Reach Out for Life, Dr. Larry Bryce. Welcome to Reach Out for Life. You're in for a treat today. Not in the very best bars and lounges across Canada. Could you hear this kind of music you're going to hear today from a man, a committed Christian who is also an evangelist and a high school teacher. Welcome today, Bob Hamilton. Thank you, Larry. My good friend, Bob Hamilton. Bob is a high school teacher of music. Bob, I read on the internet the rave reviews your <laughs> students have of your teaching. Tell us a little bit about your background. I'm a high school teacher with the Toronto District School Board. I've taught for many years, mostly mathematics, but in the last seven years approximately, mostly music, and uh, teach band and strings to all ages, grades 9 through 12. Very good. And uh, Bob, have you always been a Christian? No. I grew up in a wonderful Christian home with wonderful parents and older brothers and sisters, but it wasn't until at a very young age, really, Larry, when I was about four, that I realized, you know, I've done wrong things. And there's things that I've done wrong that I can't make right, but only God can make right by his forgiveness. And so with my father kneeling beside me at my bed one night, I asked Jesus Christ to forgive me of all my sins and live in my life, and he's done that ever since. Amen. Bob, that's great. And, you know, you have such an advantage when you do that as a young child to know the Lord all those years. It's true. When we were very small Hamiltons, and there were five Hamilton children, my mom, who has her singing degree as a voice teacher from the conservatory, taught us Hamiltons how to sing in four-part harmony. Wow. And uh, with Dad singing and playing ukulele to start with okay. as well, we began to sing in churches across Canada. And that ministry soon spread to include the States and Britain and uh, Australia and New Zealand. And uh, we've carried on that uh, ministry, uh, my parents and myself, or sometimes myself alone, uh, going to churches, conferences, to uh, encourage people with the music that we play or perhaps the spoken word and uh, a combination. It's been a big blessing. Now, Bob, you have a ministry, don't you? you? This is your sabbatical year. You're going to be ministering in churches across the country. Uh, Bob, can you show us on the piano? And this is my favorite part now. <laughs> this is good. My viewers are going to be thrilled by this. Bob, can you show us a few of the things you do in your evangelistic services, your testimonies that you give, and give us some of your testimony too as you do it. Sure. Please, Bob. Sure. There's a beautiful hymn, well-known hymn, that's called Great is Thy Faithfulness. It talks about God's faithfulness in the times when nothing seems possible, but with him all things are possible. And this is how it goes. And the chorus goes on to say, great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. And you know, God showed that faithfulness to us Hamiltons even before we were born. When mom and dad became married, they went to the doctor who informed them terrible news. They had opposite RH blood factors so that my dad was RH plus, my mom was RH negative, and the doctor said, there's no medical problem with the two of you, but if you're going to try to have children, you can expect to have probably only one child, maybe two at the most. This was devastating news to my parents, who had hoped to have a larger family, so they asked the doctor, well, is there some surgery we can do? Is there, is there a medical prescription or anything that can be done medically? And at that time, the doctor said, no, there's nothing that can be done. These are simply statistics of what happens when couples become married with opposite RH factors. And so mom and dad went home very discouraged, very sad, and they knelt beside their bed and they simply prayed, said, God, you are God of all, you are God of families. You brought us together as husband and wife. And so we commit our married life to you and our children's lives to you, however many you want to bring to us. 
And they just committed this into God's hands. And the first child came along, and there wasn't supposed to be a problem, and he was born. My oldest brother, John, no problem. Great. Uh, Mom became pregnant with the second child, and the doctors were very concerned that uh, the child would make it to full term because of this RH factor problem. And so weekly, Mom went to the hospital, Sick Kids Hospital in downtown Toronto, for blood tests and so on. And long story short, she successfully delivered the second child, and uh, the medical team... No, that wasn't me. The second child was was born with the whole medical team ready to give it a complete blood transfusion if needed. That was the serious nature if the child, in fact, made it to birth. And so the doctors then said to them, you might as well thank God for the two, but that's all you're going to have. Uh, longer story short, the third uh, child uh, came along and was born without a problem. Mom became pregnant again with a fourth child, and the fourth child came along. Some people say big problems, you, you but it was number four. Actually, no problems. Okay. Praise God. And then mom became pregnant for the fifth time, and the fifth child was born without any problem at all. Praise God. Five kids. Five, Five children, children, and the doctors have no explanation because okay. it really shouldn't have happened. I know your mom and dad are real pray, praying people, Bob, and I'm sure they were on their knees all the time you guys were coming into the family. We can only say... Great is thy faithfulness. Amen. And God provided a miracle even before we were born. And I enjoy speaking to my students and telling them that I'm glad to be their teacher because I really shouldn't be their teacher. And they say, why is that, Mr. H? And I say to them, because I shouldn't have been born. And I could tell you a few other stories when you'd like to hear them sometime. And you know, it's funny, Larry, but in spite of the fact that I try to make math lessons exciting and music lessons exciting, students would rather hear stories about why I shouldn't be their teacher, <laughs> at the end of the period especially, than finishing off with math or music. And you know, um, one story I'll, I'll mention as well that really has been a life changer for me, Larry, um, is uh, the true story when six of us Hamiltons were flying from Toronto to Belfast, Northern Ireland to do a, a time of ministry there. And uh, we flew in a 747 all night long, and as we were preparing to come in to land in Belfast, we had the seatbelt fasten signs on, and we were all buckled up, and we could see the first of the trees coming by and the, the beautiful green landscape of Northern Ireland. And just before we touched down, the pilot put the throttle full forward, all four engines wound up again on that 747, and up we went over the ocean to circle back around to the airport. And we thought this was really rather unusual. And the head steward came on and uh, made some sort of excuse that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're sorry we had to abort the, the landing. There was another plane in the way or something to that effect. So we came in the second time, and this time we're all ready again to land after eight long hours of flying. And as we came in over the runway, just before we touched down again, the pilot put the throttle full forward, and up and over the ocean we went again. And this time... The captain came on and said, ladies and gentlemen, we do have a small problem. He said to us, the panel, the cockpit panel, is indicating that the right landing gear is not fully deployed, or in common English, the wheels aren't down all the way on the right side. Now, as the wheels come down from the wing, if they're not fully down, the tendency when you try to land on them, only partially down, will be for them to pop up, and then you land on the wing and begin to do all kinds of terrible things. And so he said to us, I'm now going to do a flyby past the control tower so they can get a visual on our situation. So now this is the third time we're coming into the airport, except this time the runway is over on our left, several hundred meters, and we're just a couple of stories high coasting over the control tower, and then he again took us up over the ocean. And the sensation, Larry, is something like the bottom of a roller coaster in slow motion. Oh, Your stomach wow. just sort of does this uh, wow. lurch. And then he called all the cabin crew forward. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were left alone in the airplane for about 10 minutes. And I'll never forget when the first airline attendant, the first stewardess, came back on our aisle. She had red hair, and she was crying. Mm -hmm. And I knew we were in some serious trouble. And the pilot was very open with us and said, ladies and gentlemen, I have two choices here. I can either try to land on the bad wheels or I can belly land the plane on foam 
and I've decided to try to land on the bad wheels and please follow all the instructions that the cabin crew will give you now. Mm -hmm. And what happened next, Larry, was just incredible. They took all the bags from the upper compartments and they locked them in the washrooms. They took all the men in the airplane and they redistributed them throughout the airplane. My dad, they put with two children who were traveling by themselves. They put my younger brother, Tom, at an emergency exit to help with the evacuation of the people. One uh, dear lady, uh, she looked like she was 80 or 85, began to shake so badly that uh, I thought she wasn't even going to make it to our attempted mm -hmm. landing. Mm -hmm. And one of my sisters went over and sat with her. Mm -hmm. They left me with my mother, mm -hmm. who had badly dislocated her ankle in an, in an accident in Bermuda, a moped okay. accident. She could only hobble at best. Mm -hmm. And they told us, take eyeglasses off, pens and pencils out of your pockets, um, high-heeled shoes off. And we went through crash procedure hand over hand and how we would lean against the seat. For babies traveling on their own, they put a pillow down and the baby and another pillow and the mother would just try to sandwich hold the child. Unbeknownst to us, at the same time, uh, outside of the airplane, in the meantime, they had emptied both Belfast hospitals of all their ambulances. They'd brought them to the airport. They had turned one hangar of the airport into a temporary hospital, another hangar into a temporary morgue. They flew in the five top fire chiefs of the country. They brought in five special fire engines. They flew in two Wessex helicopters that could take probably about 20 people away, uh, and one of the large double prop Chinook helicopters that can carry away about 60 people. And they even flew a small seeker plane under our plane to get a better visual of our situation. And when we came around for the fourth and final time, we knew that this was it. And I looked for the first time, Larry, over the edge of life. Mm -hmm. And I've never ever really before or since looked at the end of life wow. so clearly because in two wow. minutes, I didn't know if Bob Hamilton was going to make it back to Canada, if part of him would make it back to Canada, mm -hmm. if he would come back in a body bag or if he would just be smoke and that would be the end. Yeah. And um, I pause when I share this story and I say to, to people and sometimes students, if you were in that airplane, and you knew that in two minutes your life might be over, do you know where you would be going? Do you know what would happen to you? And many people have different answers. Now, I'll never forget one student, after I shared this story, he came up to me and said, Mr. H, I know where I'd be going. Wow. wow. <laughs> Down, because wow. he knew he was not a good person. Wow. And I said to him, do you want to go there? He said, no, I don't. Many people say, yeah, I, I think I would know where I'm going. Most people say, I, I hope I know where I would go. And you know, they're in the same, really the same situation as Queen Victoria, who one day walked out of the St. Paul's Cathedral in England and asked her chaplain, is it really possible for someone to be sure of eternal life? Mm -hmm. Her chaplain said to her, your majesty, no one can be really sure. But that conversation, that, wasn't the answer. that conversation was published in the newspaper. Oh, okay. And a minister read it and uh -huh. sent the Queen of England uh -huh. a little note saying, uh -huh. Your Majesty, if you will consider mm -hmm. two scriptures, yeah. you may be sure of eternal life Amen. when you die. Amen. And uh, he sent her John 3.16. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's the promise for all eternity that God will never take back when you receive that gift, Bob. He'll never take it back from you. That's his promise, and you can know where you're going. Exactly, and the other scripture he sent her was Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And uh, not too, much, uh, not too long later, a few days later, maybe a few weeks, this same minister, his name was John Townsend, received a personal note from the Queen of England who said in a paraphrased, shortened version that she had read the scriptures, she had received them and believed them, and now she was sure of eternal life. Because people, and so many of us, I suppose, believe that it's the good things we've done that make us acceptable for heaven or not. But here's the Queen of England, had been baptized, confirmed, had said all the creeds, and had done wonderful things with the wealth that she owned. She was an intelligent woman. She was CEO of the whole British Empire, and uh, had uh, all these things that she had done and could be said were wonderful good works, 
but didn't give her the assurance because heaven is not based on what we've done. It's based on the free gift that God gives to Amen. us. Amen. And Larry, I must say to you that as I looked over the edge of death, for the first time in my life, I really and truly experienced what the Bible calls the peace that passes understanding. Amen. And I knew that if Bob Hamilton in 100 seconds or so yeah. was vapor, yeah. he would go to heaven, not because Amen. he was good enough, Amen. but because he had, when he was just four, yeah. said to his heavenly father, I've done wrong things. Yeah. Would you forgive me and yeah. give me the free gift of eternal life? Amen. And you know, I have students who ask me sometimes to sing and play for them. And uh, just a few weeks ago, I sang this song for, okay. for my students. Please, May I sing please, it for sing you now? And, play it. and uh, all of us are looking for a word. And uh, all of us are looking for comfort. And um, there's a mathematician many centuries ago said that within each one of us is a God-shaped vacuum that only God himself can fill. And... Uh, Life may be difficult because of physical or financial or family stress or health situations. And there's only one person that can help us here and help us in eternity. And this song talks about that. And it starts with a person who's looking for a word of hope, a word of direction, a word that is light in a dark tunnel. And here's how it goes. I sit here quietly, listening for your voice. To hear a word from you would make my soul rejoice. A word to comfort every burden of my heart. A word to comfort and to mend each broken part. A word, a word to touch my soul. A word, a word to touch my soul with your glory. A word, a word to make me whole. A word, a word to touch my soul with your glory. A word, a word to make me whole. But now what's that I hear, sounding like your voice? Your name that calls my name and makes my soul rejoice. Your word that comforts every burden of my heart. Your word that comforts and it mends each broken part. Your word, your word has touched my soul. Your word, your word has touched my soul with your glory. Your word, your word has made me whole. Your word, your word has touched my soul with your glory. Your word, your word has made me My friend, I've heard right from the Master's voice. His word will change your life. Receive him, make the choice. His word will comfort every burden of your heart. His word will comfort and it will mend each broken part. His word, his word will touch your soul. His word, his word will touch your soul with his glory. His word, his word will make you whole. His word, his word will touch your soul with his glory. His word, his word will make you whole.
Your word, your word has touched my soul. Amen, Bob. We only have a second left. If there's someone in our television audience who wants to be sure of going to heaven, could you take just a couple of moments and help them? Look into the camera right behind them. Whatever your problem, Jesus knows about it. Whatever the difficulty, he can handle it. Whatever the dilemma, he can be the one to bring peace in the midst of the storm. He is the rock and the only rock on which any one of us can stand. May I share with you the prayer that I've shared with many, many people, many students who weren't sure or knew for sure they weren't going to heaven, but wanted to be sure. May I pray this prayer responsively with you. I'll just say it one sentence at a time and just repeat it after me. Listen to it carefully, and if you believe it with your whole heart, repeat it, and God will receive it from your heart. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I come to you now to confess to you that I have done wrong things, that I have sinned against you. But today, Heavenly Father, I do believe like Queen Victoria believed, that you loved the world so much that you gave your Son, Jesus Christ, to pay the penalty for each person's sins. I ask you now to forgive all my sins by the blood that Jesus Christ shed on the cross for me and for each person who will ask. I now receive your free gift of eternal life. Write my name in your book of life that I may live forever with you. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Whether we're a patient in the hospital, someone at home, a new Canadian, young or old, Bob, when we say that prayer with you, we know we're going to see each other in heaven. Please write to us for your own copy of Canadian author Alison Restagno's very popular book called Modern Day Miracle, the true story of 50 divine encounters, supernatural healings, and experiences of heaven and hell. Read how God supernaturally intervened to save a family from certain death when their home caught fire. And the testimony of Pat Robertson, how his $70 television station miracle launched the multinational Christian media giant, the CBN Television Network, and the 700 Club. This book will increase your faith in asking God for your miracle and increase your spiritual temperature in seeing God's work in the world today. Our new address is Reach Out Ministries, Post Office Box 11, Simcoe, Ontario, N3Y 3N0. For those of you who may wonder, Bob's plane did arrive safely and he did survive that terrible flight. You know, what a treasure to the Christian church to have music like we heard from Bob Hamilton. Music is so important to the church. In fact, one of the times music is most important in the church is during wedding ceremonies. All the music in a wedding ceremony is played with everything prepared and planned so that the congregation, the family and friends, and the groom 
everybody will be prepared for the bride to come down the aisle. That is the climactic moment in a wedding service. Music is just as important during the worship service in a Sunday morning in church. It does the same thing. But this time, it prepares the bride, which is the church, for the groom, who is Jesus Christ, to come into the lives of people worshiping on a Sunday morning. Music prepares the heart for receiving the bridegroom. Paul observed this same thing in writing to his beloved Christian church in Ephesus, where he spent three years in ministry. And in this letter to the Ephesians, Paul compares the love between a bride and her groom to the love between Christ and his church. And music makes this reality come home in a wonderful way. Music in church prepares the bride for her bridegroom. Bob has led you in a prayer to receive Christ. Let me now close with a prayer for you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the joy of music and the ministry of faithful servants like Bob Hamilton. Bless Bob that he may have a great outreach and win many souls to Christ through his words and his ministry of music. Bless the churches that they may have music that prepares the hearts and minds of the bride of Christ, of those who come to church seeking after God for the bridegroom to come into their life. For we ask it with much thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Friends, as Bob has prayed, and as we close, now continue your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you, friends. Please write to us for your own copy of Canadian author Alison Rastagno's very popular book called Modern Day Miracle, the true story of 50 divine encounters, supernatural healings, and experiences of heaven and hell. Read how God supernaturally intervened to save a family from certain death when their home caught fire. And the testimony of Pat Robertson, how his $70 television station miracle launched the multinational Christian media giant, the CBN Television Network, and the 700 Club. This book will increase your faith in asking God for your miracle and increase your spiritual temperature in seeing God's work in the world today. Our new address is Reach Out Ministries, Post Office Box 11, Simcoe, Ontario, N3Y 3N0. Remember today, reach out for life, reach out for Jesus Christ. Closed captioning is sponsored in part by Gospel Lighthouse Bookstores of Southwestern Ontario.